Hi, I'm enjoying reading Fantastic Mr. Fox with you. Last time we read chapters one through four, and today I'm going to start with chapter five of Fantastic Mr. Fox by Roald Dahl with illustrations by Quentin Blake. Do you remember the foxes were digging and digging to get away from the shovels? Let's see what happens now. Chapter five, The Terrible Tractors. As the sun rose the next morning, Bogus and Bunce and Bean were still digging. They had dug a hole so deep you could have put a house into it, but they had not yet come to the end of the fox's tunnel. They were all very tired and cross. Dang and blast, said Bogus. Whose rotten idea was this? Bean's idea, said Bunce. Bogus and Bunce both stared at Bean. Bean took another swig of cider, then put the flask back into his pocket without offering it to the others. Listen, he said angrily. I want that fox. I'm going to get that fox. I'm not giving in until I've strung him up over my front porch, dead as a dumpling. We can't get him by digging, that's for sure, said the fat Bogus. I've had enough of digging. Bunce, the little pot-bellied dwarf, looked up at Bean and said, Have you got any more bad ideas then? What? said Bean. I can't hear you. Bean never took a bath. He never even washed. As a result, his ear holes were clogged with all kinds of muck and wax and bits of chewing gum and dead flies and stuff like that. This made him deaf. Speak louder, he said to Bunce. And Bunce shouted back, Got any more bad ideas? Bean rubbed the back of his neck with a dirty finger. He had a boil coming there and it itched. What we need on this job, he said, is machines, mechanical shovels. This was a pretty good idea and the other two had to admit it. All right, then, Bean said, taking charge. Bogus, you stay here and see that the fox doesn't escape. Bunce and I will go and fetch our machinery. If he tries to get out, shoot him, quick. The long, thin bean walked away. The tiny bunce tr trotted after him. The fat bogus stayed where he was with his gun pointed at the foxhole. Soon, two enormous caterpillar tractors with mechanical shovels on their front ends came clanging into the wood. Bean was driving one. There's a picture. They look mad. Bunce, the other. The machines were both black. They were murderous, brutal looking monsters. Here we go then, shouted Bean. Death to the fox, shouted Bunce. The machines went to work, biting huge mouthfuls of soil out of the hill. The big tree under which Mr. Fox had dug his hole in the first place was toppled like a match stick. On all sides, rocks were sent flying and trees were falling and the noise was deafening. Down in the tunnel, the foxes crouched, listening to the terrible clanging and banging overhead. What's happening, Dad? cried the small foxes. What are they doing? Mr. Fox didn't know what was happening or what they were doing. It's an earthquake, cried Mrs. Fox. Look, said one of the small foxes, our tunnels got shorter. I can see daylight. They all looked round, and yes, the mouth of the tunnel was only a few feet away from them now. And in the circle of daylight beyond, they could see the two huge black tractors almost on top of them. Tractors, shouted Mr. Fox, and mechanical shovels dig for your lives. Dig, dig, dig. Uh-oh. Chapter six. Shall we keep going? The race. Now there began a desperate race. The machines against the foxes. In the beginning, the hill looked like this. This picture right over here. After about an hour, as the machines bit away more and more soil from the hilltop, it looked like this. Sometimes the foxes would gain a little ground and the clanking noises would go, grow fainter and Mr. Fox would say, we're going to make it, I'm sure we are. 
But then a few moments later, the machines would come back at them and the crunch of the mighty shovels would get louder and louder. Once, the foxes actually saw the sharp metal edge of one of the shovels as it scraped up the earth just behind them. Keep going, my darlings, panted Mr. Fox. Don't give up. Keep going, the fat bogus shouted to Bunce and Bean. We'll get him any moment now. Have you caught sight of him yet? Bean called back. Not yet, shouted Bogus, but I think you're close. I'll pick him up with my bucket, shouted Bunce. I'll chop him to pieces. But by lunchtime, the machines were still at it. And so were the poor foxes. The hill now looked like this. The farmers didn't stop for lunch. They were too keen to finish the job. Here they are. Hey there, Mr. Fox, yelled Bunce leaning out of his tractor. We're coming to get you now. You've had your last chicken, yelled Bogus. You'll never come prowling around my farm again. A sort of madness had taken hold of the three men. The tall skinny bean and the dwarfish pot belly bunts were driving their machines like maniacs, racing the motors and making the shovels dig at a terrific speed. The fat Bogus was hopping about like a dervish and shouting faster, faster. By five o'clock in the afternoon, this is what ha had happened to the hill. The hole the machines had dug was like the crater of a volcano. It was such an extraordinary sight that crowds of people came rushing out from the surrounding villages to have a look. They stood on the edge of the crater and stared down at Bogus and Bunsen Bean. Hey there, Bogus, what's going on? We're after a fox. You must be mad. The people jeered and laughed. But this only made the three farmers more furious and more obstinate and more determined than ever not to give up until they had caught the fox. Those are good people. The next chapter is chapter seven. We'll never let him go. At six o'clock in the evening, Bean switched off the motor of his tractor and climbed down from the driver's seat. Bunce did the same. Both men had had enough. They were tired and stiff from driving the tractors all day. They were also hungry. Slowly, they walked over to the small fox's hole in the bottom of the huge crater. Bean's face was purple with rage. Bunce was cursing the fox with dirty words that cannot be printed. Bogus came waddling up. Dang and blast that filthy, stinking fox, he said. What do we do now? I'll tell you what we don't do, Bean said. We don't let him go. We'll never let him go, Bunce declared. Never, 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 cried Bogus. Did you hear that, Mr. Fox, yelled Bean, bending low and shouting down the hole. It's not over yet, Mr. Fox. We're not going home till we've strung you up dead as a dingbat. Whereupon the three men all shook hands with one another and swore a solemn oath that they would not go back to their farms until the fox was caught. What's the next move? asked Bunce, the pot-bellied dwarf. We're sending you down the hole to fetch him up, said Bean. Down you go. Not me, screamed Bunce, running away. Bean made a sickly smile. When he smiled, you saw his scarlet gums. You saw more gums than teeth. Then there's only one thing to do, he said. We starve him out. We camp here day and night watching the hole. Watching the hole. He'll come out in the end. He'll have to. So Bogus and Bunsen and Bean sent messages down to their farms asking for tents, sleeping bags, and supper. Chapter 8. The Foxes Begin to Starve. That evening, three tents were put up in this crater of the hill, one for Bogus, one for Bunce, and one for Bean. The tents surrounded Mr. Fox's hole, and the three farmers sat outside their tents eating their supper. Bogus had three boiled chickens smothered in dumplings, Bunce had six donuts filled with disgusting goose liver paste, and Bean had two gallons of cider. 
All three of them kept their guns beside them. Bogus picked up a steaming chicken and held it close to the fox's hole. Can you smell this, Mr. Fox? He shouted. Lovely, tender chicken. Why don't you come up and get it? The rich scent of chicken wafted down the tunnel to where the foxes were crouching. Oh, Dad, said one of the small foxes. Couldn't we just sneak up and snatch it out of his hand? Don't you dare, said Mrs. Fox. That's just what they want you to do. But we're so hungry, they cried. How long will it be till we get something to eat? Their mother didn't answer them, nor did their father. There was no answer to give. As darkness fell, Bunts and Bean switched on the powerful, he powerful headlamps of the two tractors and shone them on the hole. Now, said Bean, we'll take it in turn to keep watch. Our watches, one watches while well, two sleep and so on all through the night. Bogus said, what if the fox digs a hole right through the hill and comes out on the other side? You didn't think of that, did you? Of course I did, said Bean pretending he had. Go on then, tell us the answer, said Bogus. Bean picked something small and black out of his ear and flicked it away. How many men have you got working on your farm, he asked. 35, Bogus said. I've got 36, said Bunce. And I've got 37, Bean said. That makes 108 men altogether. We must order them to surround the hill. Each man will have a gun and a flashlight. There will be no escape then from Mr. Fox. So the order went down to the farms and that night 108 men formed a tight ring around the bottom of the hill. They were armed with sticks and guns and hatchets and pistols and all sorts of other horrible weapons. This made it quite impossible for a fox or indeed any other animal to escape from the hill. The next day, the watching and waiting went on. Bogus and Bunce and Bean sat upon small stools, staring at the fox's hole. They didn't talk much. They just sat there with their guns on their laps. Every so often, Mr. Fox would creep a little closer towards the mouth of the tunnel and take a sniff. Then he would creep back again and say, they're still there. Are you quite sure? Mrs. Fox would ask. Positive, said Mr. Fox. I can smell that man Bean a mile away. He stinks. Chapter 9. Mr. Fox Has a Plan For three days and three nights, this waiting game went on. How long can a fox go without food or water? Bogus asked on the third day. Not much longer now, Bean told him. He'll make a run for it soon. He'll have to. Bean was right. Down in the tunnel, the foxes were slowly but surely starving. If only we could have just a tiny sip of water, said one of the small foxes. Oh, Dad, can't you do something? Could we make a dash for it, Dad? Well, we'd have a little bit of a chance, wouldn't we? No chance at all, snapped Mrs. Fox. I refuse to let you go up there and face those guns. I'd sooner you stay down here and die in peace. Mr. Fox had not spoken for a long time. He had been sitting quite still, his eyes closed, not even hearing what the others were saying. Mrs. Fox knew that he was trying desperately to think of a way out. And now, as she looked at him, she saw him stir himself and get slowly to his feet. He looked back at his wife. There was a little spark of excitement dancing in his eyes. What is it, darling? said Mrs. Fox quickly. I've just had a bit of an idea, Mr. Fox said carefully. What? they cried. Oh, Dad, what is it? Come on, said Mrs. Fox, tell us quickly. Well, said Mr. Fox. Then he stopped and sighed and sadly shook his head. He sat down again. It's no good, he said. It won't work after all. Oh. Why not, Dad? because it means more digging and we aren't any of us strong enough for that after three days and nights without food. Yes, we are, Dad, cried the small foxes, jumping up and running to their father. We can do it. You see if we can't. So can you. Mr. Fox looked at the four small foxes and he smiled. What fine children I have, he thought. 
They are starving and they haven't had a drink for three days, but they are still undefeated. I must not let them down. I, I suppose we could give it a try, he said. Let's go, Dad. Tell us what you want us to do. Slowly, Mrs. Fox got to her feet. She was suffering more than any of them from lack of food and water. She was very weak. I'm so sorry, she said, but I don't think I'm going to be much help. You stay right where you are, my darling, said Mr. Fox. We can handle this by ourselves. Chapter 10, Fox's Chicken House, number one. This time, we must go in a very special direction, said Mr. Fox, pointing sideways and downward. So he and his four children started digging once again. The work went much more slowly now, yet they kept at it with great courage, and little by little, the tunnel began to grow. Dad, I wish you would tell us where we are going, said one of the children. I dare not do that, said Mr. Fox, because this place I'm hoping to get to, get to is so marvelous that if I described it to you now, you would go crazy with excitement. And then if we failed to get there, which is very possible, you would die of disappointment. I don't want to raise your hopes too much, my darlings. For a long, long time, they kept on digging. For how long, they did not know, because there were no days and nights down there in the murky tunnel. But at last, Mr. Fox gave the order to stop. I think, he said, we had better take a peep upstairs now and see where we are. I know where I want to be, but I can't possibly be sure we're anywhere near it. Slowly, wearily, the foxes began to slope the tunnel up toward towards the surface. Up and up it went until suddenly they came to something hard above their heads, and they couldn't go any further. Mr. Fox reached up to examine this hard thing. It's wood, he whispered, wooden planks. What does that mean, Dad? It means, unless I'm very much mistaken, that we are right underneath somebody's house, whispered Mr. Fox. Be very quiet now while I take a peek. Carefully, Mr. Fox began pushing up one of the floorboards. The board creaked most terribly, and they all ducked down waiting for something awful to happen. Nothing did. So Mr. Fox very cautiously, he, and then, um, so Mr. So Mr. Fox pushed up a second board and then very, very cautiously, he poked his head up through the gap. He let out a shriek of excitement. I've done it, he yelled. I've done it first time, I've done it, I've done it. He pulled himself up through the gap in the floor and started prancing and dancing with joy. Come up, he sang out, come up and see where you are, my darlings. What a sight for a hungry fox. Hallelujah, hooray, hooray. The four small foxes scrambled up out of the tunnel and what a fantastic sight it was that now met their eyes. There were, they were in a huge shed and the whole place was teeming with chickens. There were white chickens and brown chickens and black chickens by the thousand. Bogus's chicken house. Number one, cried Mr. Fox. It's exactly what I was aiming at. I hit it slap in the middle first time. Isn't that fantastic? And if I may say so, rather clever. The small foxes went wild with excitement. They started running around in all directions, chasing the chickens. Wait, ordered Mr. Fox. Don't lose your head. Stand back. Calm down. Let's do this properly. First of all, everyone have a drink of water. They all ran over to the chicken's drinking trough and lapped up the lovely cool water. Then Mr. Fox chose three of the plumpest hens and with a clever flick of his jaw, he killed them instantly. Back to the tunnel, he ordered, come on. No fooling around, the quicker you move, the quicker you shall have something to eat. One after another, they climbed down through the hole in the floor and soon they were all standing once again in the dark tunnel. Mr. Fox reached up and pulled the floorboards back into place. He did this with great care. He did it so that no one could tell 
they had ever been moved. My son, he said, giving the three plump hens to the biggest of his four small children, run back with these to your mother. Tell her to prepare a feast. Tell her the rest of us will be along in a jiffy as soon as we have made a few other little arrangements. All right, so that was the end of chapter 10. I'll stop there for today and another day we'll continue on with chapter 11.